Hi, my name is Pam Lieber, and I'm a licensed clinical therapist with the Wen Center for Loss and Healing. Hi, my name is Erin Hill, and I'm a clinical graduate intern with the Wen Center for Loss and Healing. So I wanted to give just a brief overview of the partnership um, that the Wen Center has with Arena Stage. We are really honored um, to have this longstanding partnership with the Voices of Now program. Um, where we provide for our young people the opportunity to share their story um, and, and learn from their grief in a more artistic, expressive way. Um, we, we begin by gathering everybody um, in the way that a typical therapy group might form. Um, and um, the difference is that in this particular setting, um, our therapy groups are sort of eavesdropped on um, by our, our arena stage artists. Um, who then take the words and the feelings and the thoughts of our young people and are able to formulate it into a script um, and, and into what it is that you saw this evening. And so um, we are really um, fortunate to, to be able to offer for young people who want um, an artistic way of continuing their grief journey um, to sort of um, continue to tell their story, continue to share their emotions, continue to educate our community while at the same time healing themselves. And so for me and Pam in the WEN Center, our roles are really to be present and to be here and to listen and to support our amazing, incredible artists and to also listen for themes and threads from all of our rehearsals and to explore not just what may be said, but things that may be unsaid and to process that in a space where people feel comfortable and listened to and valued and heard where they can bring their authentic selves and we're also here to have fun and to enjoy ourselves um, and each other's company throughout this process. And it has been really such an honor and a privilege um, and so much fun to be here with everyone. Hi, my name is Fareed Mostofi. Hi, my name is Rebecca Campana. We are so lucky to be the co-directors of the piece you are about to see, Roadmap. Uh, we embarked on the process of creating the script and the reading you are about to see at the beginning of February with an incredible group of artists. And we started with uh, a question, which was generally, what does this group have to say, want to say, and want to explore about our experiences with grief and loss? We started to explore that question in a lot of ways. We had lots of discussions over Zoom. We did some digital discussions using Jamboard. We drew, we created original stories, we moved a lot and uh, created a lot of really fascinating art, uh, exploring how this virtual environment can inspire a lot of creativity and creativity that can help us explore our stories in new ways. Uh, over the course of our exploration, we realized we were not only exploring our experiences of grief throughout our lives, but also how this past year, as we've navigated the COVID-19 pandemic and so many other challenges, has uniquely uh, influenced some of what we want to say and what we want to ask about what it looks like to grieve. That exploration led to the piece you are about to see, Roadmap, and I'll turn it over to Becca to tell us a little bit more about that piece. As in all Voices of Now performances, every word that you're about to hear was spoken or written by one of the ensemble members. However, in the performance, artists might not be saying the same words that they spoke in the rehearsal. So anyone could be saying any line. The performance roadmap explores how we navigate our unique journeys through grief. And it asks some pretty important questions. What is the roadmap for grief? Are we supposed to grieve a certain way? And when you're grieving, what's the destination? Or is it just about getting through it? We hope that you will enjoy watching Roadmap.
Grief. It sounds like the clock ticking. The ringing in your ear before you lose hearing. The feeling you get when you want to cry, but can't. Grief. It's a dark cave you are running from that overtakes you anyway. It's like playing with a guitar with muted strings that worked right before. And you think, why isn't this working right? Why aren't I working right? Grief is like being stuck in traffic. Sometimes it's moving fast and sometimes you're stuck in it. And when you're stuck in it, it feels like forever. And people say it'll pass, but it's not passing. It feels like chronic back pain. It tastes like dry mouth. It's uncomfortable. You know what grief is like? It's like a cold sore. They come and every time you get one, you think, oh man, this sucks. And then one day it just goes away and you forget about it. And then it comes back. Grief is the same way. When it hits, you just have to deal with it. I'm the oldest of five kids. When my brother Makai was born, we knew he was going to have a heart defect and we planned for surgery. They said he couldn't breastfeed and all this other stuff, but he was proving everyone wrong and he was performing well. Then we learned there was an issue with his brain. My mom decided to let him live out his natural life. I didn't really know how to process it because I was young and I wasn't really sure what to do. I was like, he was here, he's not anymore. And I didn't really know what else to say. Sometimes I still think of my brother Makai. I have a box. And whenever I have an achievement, I put something in there for him and he gets it. It's like a mailbox to have it. And sometimes when I put something on top of it, it falls. It's like he's playing in my room. I really only held my brother once before he died because I was so scared. And when my youngest brother was born a few years later, I debated on holding him too. But finally I did and he pooped on me. And now my youngest brother and I are like this. I'm not going to say that is because I lost my brother Makai, but I do hold him close. When you're grieving, it's like you're driving on a winding road. A rocky road. A road to nowhere. You don't know the train, and navigating can be confusing. How do I get through this? Can I pull over? What is the roadmap for grief? After my dad died, I was in shock. So after three days, I went back to school. Teachers were like, why are you back? They were, didn't say anything, but I knew they were wondering. And then when I took an extra week off, they were like, you took too much time off. How do I please people? I feel like I got judged when I took two weeks off of school. It wasn't even enough for me, but I had to go back. I saw my friend's messages and they were like, we miss you and come back to school. It was kind hearted, but at the time going back to school was not what I wanted to do. They didn't give me any time. How long are you supposed to grieve? Are you supposed to grieve a certain way? What are the rules of the road for grieving? One, be sad for three weeks. Then you're done. Two, cry at the funeral. Three, you can't smile. Four, you have to talk about the person who died all the time. Five, but also, don't bring it up. Wait, should you bring it up or not bring it up? And how do you answer the question, how are you doing? It's hard to navigate something you've never done before. Well, we don't need rules. We need a map. But a map just shows lines. It doesn't actually show what's going to be in the road. Like if the road will be smooth or if it will be bumpy. It's like when people write about the five stages of grief. It doesn't actually show what it's going to be like in that feeling.
When my dad first died, my counselor gave me this book. It explained the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. It had these questions and answers. It actually made me really mad because I wasn't experiencing everything in it. I wondered, am I doing it right? Am I normal? One of the things that was helpful in the beginning was sharing memories of my dad rather than talking about his death or how he died. My dad, Chuck, was a leader. He went through so many phases, but he was always a leader. He owned a restaurant because he decided to own a restaurant. He owned a coffee shop because he wanted to own a coffee shop. He made his own little business at 16 where he would wash boats. He loved building stuff. He built chess tables outside of my school. When I was a kid, I drew a kid's drawing of a house and he started building a house using that drawing. When I was in the sixth grade, we had this play, The Lion King. My dad took it upon himself to build Pride Rock. He would spend all night working on this rock. He just did because he wanted to. My dad loved the beach. He loved sunsets. I'd love to see his phone because it's probably full of sunsets. Our beach house was on Sunset Island and every day without a skip, he would say, let's go on a sunset bike ride. And I would say yes, because I loved spending time with him. My experience with grief, I don't know how to describe it. And I'm still learning. How do I know where I am on my journey through grief? When do we need a map? When we're lost? When we need to be found. When you have a horrible sense of direction. When we want to go put someplace new. When you're grieving, what is your destination? Or is it just about getting through it? Right now, we are over one year into the COVID-19 pandemic and many of us are experiencing some kind of grief and all the emotions that go with it. I think it's supposed to be a unifying thing. We are all in this together, but it makes you feel like you're a part of one big group. It feels like I don't have my own emotions to express anymore. I feel alone, but so does everyone. You are going through so much, but so is everyone. In my college prep class, they were talking to us about writing a proper college essay. They say, don't write about COVID this year. Don't write about that. Why? They are saying that everyone is experiencing COVID. So from the perspective of an administrator, they are going to be reading the same type of essay over and over. It's like our feelings are all the same. But we are not all having the same experience. Everyone is experiencing COVID differently. Everyone grieves differently. When someone dies in a movie, literally the world stops. The character dies and everyone focuses on you. It's not like that in real life. Someone dies and everyone who was affected is affected. It's like you're the side character in the story. Your grief is not important to everyone around you. Grief is collective and it can also be very individual. It's important not to lose sight of that. There can be the expectation that we're all in the same place with our grief. But we can be in different places. No one's grief journey is going to look the same, and we're not all going to need the same things. How do you grieve when everyone else around you is also grieving? When everyone is going through a lot, what do you do with your emotions? We wear masks, and we're masking our emotions. It's like Six feet away, everyone. Six feet away, emotions. Sometimes when I push my emotions away, it's unintentional. It just happens when I'm feeling a lot. I push them away. I hide my emotions because I don't think people will understand. Nobody wants to put their stuff out there and then have someone say, it's not right. I used to have a larger friend group, but people kept telling me, just don't be sad. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not that simple. If it was that simple, I wouldn't be sad. It's like telling a starving person not to be hungry. There's also this sense of guilt. Am I over-exaggerating? Am I taking it out of proportion? I find myself putting on what feels like a dress full of points. It's kind of aggressive, like a porcupine. 
it, full, it forms a shell around me to protect me. See the shadow around my heart? That is my grief. But the stress can also keep me away from people and from their love. How do we make rooms for our emotions and each other? was always there for me when I was sad or upset. One night I was upset because I was going to my dad's house where I live now. She said, we're going to take bits of our hearts and trade them so that you'll always have bits of my heart and I'll always have bits of your heart. My mom used to make candles so I'd always have something to remember her. We used to watch a bunch of movies together and I keep finding movies that I used to watch with my mom and I'll have no idea that I watch them with her until the movie starts and I'm getting all the details and I start to think, I've watched this before and it, it's comforting. My mom would have music playing a lot. Every day on the way home from school, we listened to Taylor Swift because I love her songs. We used to sing, <laughs> we are never, never, ever, ever, getting back together because I love that song so much. My mom forgot to make her playlist private on YouTube so I can still see her favorite songs. After my mom died, my friends didn't want to tell me what they were going through a hard time, even though I'm not supposed to put my emotions to the side. Along with my problems, I took comfort in helping others. I knew I shouldn't. I bawled my feelings and then I let myself show emotions. They came out like a waterfall of anger and sadness and confusion. I've had multiple people tell me that their feelings don't matter because what I went through was so much worse and they do. Your feelings matter so much. I'm entitled to my feelings and you're entitled to your feelings. There's no single roadmap for grief and no one should make one because it's based on your personality and your relationship to the person. When you're grieving, you're drawing your own map. You're plotting your own course. How can we help each other find our own ways through grief? Death is inevitable. I hate saying that, but it's a part of life. Everyone experiences it at some point. And even though my grief path is unique, we may encounter some similar terrain or situations along the road. When you've experienced grief yourself, you get a new awareness for things, an understanding that everyone is going to experience grief, losing a job, losing a parent, anything. I know that I will never fully understand someone else's grief, but even though we are in unique paths, we can help each other. It's like asking for directions when you get lost. Some people are forced to navigate grief on their own because they don't have anyone. And I feel bad for the people who have to do on their own, especially when I have people in my corner. We can support people in a lot of different ways. Ask the person directly, what are your boundaries? What helps you? People can be afraid of doing something wrong, so they won't say anything. If someone is grieving, talk to them straight about it. Don't Google, please don't Google grief. I would love for people to ask me, what are the ways that I can help you when you're grieving? Instead of worrying about it. It's not your job to make me feel better. And I'm not always sad. I don't want to always be sad. I want to be happy because happy is fun. I like to be happy and to have fun. I need space for growing and changing feelings. Give me options. Listen without judging. Don't have expectations. This might be someone's first time grieving and you might be going through it together for the first time. The way I see it, Grief isn't so much about a road map as a road trip. I'm the driver of the car and the music playing is the mood I'm in. I need snacks for the ride. It's a long ride. My mood swings are the curves in the road and my depression is locked in the trunk. On days when I can do it alone, do it on my own, I do. But some days I need a co-pilot and being my co-pilot may require sitting with my pain. 
even when it's uncomfortable. Grief is a hard journey. It can even be dangerous at times, but it is necessary. You can't go over it, around it or under it. You might as well go through it. You have to go through it and it changes you. Trying to be the same after someone dies is a lost cause. You have to find your new normal, a new road. And finding your road starts with honoring your feelings. So that is my advice. Honor your feelings. <laughs>